Hello everyone and thank you for joining us on this episode of the Akkad and Coca Report. I'm Michel Akkad in San Francisco and my co-host Anish Coca joins us from Philadelphia. Now I normally introduce the topic of each episode by providing some background information or by raising the major questions to be addressed on the show. But for this episode I am simply, simply going to give the title of the book we're going to discuss with its author. The book is called Thieves of Virtue When Bioethics Stole Medicine. What a glorious title this is, and needless to say, a self-explanatory one. Our guest is Tom Koch, a man whose resume and whose many books read like great adventure stories, even if some of his publications are technical and philosophical in focus. Professor Koch is an author, journalist, historian, philosopher, and educator. He holds an interdisciplinary PhD in medical cartography, ethics, and medicine. He teaches medical ethics at the University of British Columbia in Vancouver. He is a consultant in gerontology, and he has written numerous books, both for an ac academic audience as well as for the general public. His books include Cartographies of Disease, Ethics in Everyday Places, The Wreck of the Mil William Brown, and the volume that will be the focus of our discussion today, Thieves of Virtue. Tom, welcome to the show. It's nice to be here. Thank you. We're delighted to have you. So, Tom, bioethics now is a permanent fixture, or seems to be a permanent fixture of the healthcare landscape. And in fact, it's not only well established, it's, it's growing. I think bioethics department, departments are, are growing. Job openings for bioethicists are plentiful from what I hear. Um, but here you are with this book that was published by the MIT Press in, uh, 2000 and uh, when, when was it published? Um, 2011. 2011. This is a hand grenade thrown into the bioethics community. <laughs> and, I, and I certainly hope I certainly hope it's a hand grenade. Most of the bioethicists want to know why I was so nasty in my tone, but I really didn't think I was. Bioethics makes certain claims about the necessity of the field and its relation to medicine, which have never really been well examined. And they haven't been examined in the context of the medicine we practice, that is, we as a society. As you know, and as your listeners know, medicine, we talk a lot about the technical advances that have gone on in the last several decades. In your own fields of cardiology, they've been immense. We go back I go back to the 60s with the beginning of uh, the genetic research, and we say, wow, this is terrific. We know so much. What we forget, however, is that since the 1830s, medicine has been a moving target. Every generation has had tools and technologies and insights which were unavailable to the previous generations. The reusable syringe was introduced in 1831. Morphine was brought in in the 1830s uh, for pain control. It was considered very good with rhubarb, very, very, by the way, in the days of cholera. <laughs> we had the first medical statistics in the 1840s, the first epidemiology that we recognized as epi epidemiology in the 1850s. We had Koch's postulates, we had Pasteur's work. The last century, the 19th century, was a moving target. Then we had, we had bacteriology, but it wasn't until almost you were young that we had a real virology. X-ray has changed remarkably. And then since the 60s, things have changed. What didn't change across most of this history was the idea of medicine, which was very simple and very profound. And that was the one that began with Hippocrates back around 500 BC. And that was that the role of the medical professional, of the doctor, and then later the nurse, was this into each house I go, that the job was the service and the care of the individual person. And that that was a responsibility. And for this, you weren't promised a lot of money. You weren't promised a Nobel Prize. You weren't going to get a spot on TV. What you were going to get was the satisfaction of having done well by your fellow citizens and fulfilling the oath that you had pledged as a student. And that held across really several millennia since 500 BC. 
something strange, a congruence of events of history, and this is medical history, began in the 1960s. First, there was renodialysis, an extraordinary thing whereby people with kidney disease could be saved through these blood transfusion machines and cleaning machines. Okay. Beginning in the 1860s, three things seemed to change in medicine. One of them was with renodialysis, its extraordinary ability to save patients with kidney disease through a way of cleaning their blood, of keeping them alive. And the problem was that there weren't enough renodialysis machines and enough beds to treat all the patient, patients who needed. At the same time in the 1860s, we had the first heart transplant by Christian Bernard in South Africa, in which he took a African-American woman's heart and put it into a white woman whose heart was failing. The 1960s, you said, you said 1860s, but just- to I'm sorry, 1960s. Right. It's a problem with being a historian. <laughs> and so both of these brought forward something which was new to the American psyche. And that was the idea of scarcity. <clears throat> weren't enough beds, there weren't enough machines, and there weren't enough hearts. And when immunosuppressant therapies came along in the 1970s and made more transplants possible, people said, what are we going to do when we can't save everybody? At the same time in the United States, you had the Affordable Care Act, which came through in 1964. The, the Medicare, which, Medicare Act, which, sorry. Medicare and Medicaid. Right, yeah. And that said the government had something to do with assuring the care of the elderly and the poor. And so all of a sudden, what had been this very lovely idea of care, mostly for white folk, middle-class folk, fee-for-service hospitals, and scarcity, who's gonna make the decisions? With the issue of dialysis, and a very famous article in Life magazine on the people who made those decisions, the God Committee, as they called it, some moral philosophers got involved in the question of how do we choose who is worthy? And rather than just writing a paper some 15 people will read on Kant, they were actually listened to as intelligent people. And so bioeth philosophers interested in ethics came to see themselves as people who had something to contribute to these discussions of, of scarcity. Now, not being economists and not being clinicians, they had no concern for the individual patient, but rather for the economics of scarcity at large. There really was no scarcity. In 1974, Congress passed a law making the dialysis an entitlement, and poof, everybody had beds and dialysis machines. Bioethicists came along, however, and said, we have this problem of scarcity, we can't save everybody. In the 1980s, we had the era of Reaganomics and Margaret Thatcher and of a new type of look by government which made economics of the corporation the most important thing. They wanted cost efficiencies and they wanted cost efficiencies in medicine where Medicaid and Medicare were eating up some money. And bioethicists early in the game jumped into this, people like Danny Callahan. Uh, from the Hastings Center. And they argued that medicine had to change its mind. It was, medicine was not, and professionals in medicine were not trained to make decisions for the greater good, but only for their patient. And so medicine had to be restrained, it had to be reined in. And people who were somehow better trained in complex decision making had to take the lead. And that would, of course, be the bioethicists. Right. So they came forward as the saviors, as the professionals who would make these decisions and who would adjudicate the hard cases. The problem was none of them ever looked at the reasons for scarcity and failure, never asked why is medicine getting so expensive? They accepted that as a given. They accepted the given and said, what are we going to do? Who can we cut from the lists? Daniel Callahan wanted to stop care for seniors over 65. I think he might have started at 55. He, last I heard, was in his frail 80s and still said this is the problem, but he was a little early on that. And of right. course, he has the money for affordable care. 
And this is an idea that uh, that continues to to pop up. Uh, I think a couple of years ago, uh, Ezekiel Emmanuel wrote an article. I don't know if you're familiar with it. It made yes. a big splash. Uh, that he said that he wanted his his, you know, he wanted to set himself up up as an example. He said, when I'm 75 or so, you know, you can, uh, you know, Ezekiel turn off. Always from... He always had a, a a mouth that was bigger than his brain. If you ask me. <laughs> So you you um, you have a, you use a term for this uh, this way of thinking, um, uh, lifeboat ethics, and maybe yes. maybe I don't know if it's if you if it's you coining the term or if the term is actually used in the uh, uh, bioethical I, literature. I would love to take credit, but it was actually I first read about it in 1992 in an article by Louis Lasagna, then dean of the Sackler School of Medicine in Boston who wrote about lifeboat ethics and used the case of the William Brown. And in those days, I was mostly making my living as a magazine and news writer. And I read this short piece in science and I said, this is very, very wrong. It was a story of a sailing ship that got holed in the North Atlantic around the same area as the Titanic only 60 years earlier. Half the patients went down with the ship. I'm sorry. Half the crew went down with the, and passengers with the ship. Half were saved to the single lifeboat. Right. The, the ship hit, hit an iceberg or something like that? Yes. Right. It's a prequel to the Titanic. I keep right. trying to sell the movie rights. <laughs> um, and so of those who were saved, all the crew and half the passengers, the next night when it got stormy, the first mate who was in charge told his crew to throw over half of the passengers to lighten the boat. It's unbelievable. This became a very famous case in U.S. jurisprudence. And I just didn't believe it. It was too pat. And so I eventually had to go to London and France to read original documents to piece together what happened. But the term lifeboat ethics is this idea that some must die, that a few will live. And I took this and researched it historically, but I looked at it in terms of American healthcare and healthcare internationally to see why is the le why is the lifeboat so leaky? Why is there only one lifeboat for all of us? Bioethicists never wanted to ask that. Uh, they wanted to say, how do we manage our scarcities? And how do we look at this whole issue of the role of a physician or a nurse or health professional in the care of the fragile person? And they decided that doctors were not crediting the autonomy and the desires of the patient. They were making arbitrary decisions. They didn't know enough about the economics, although very few bioethicists are trained in economics. And so they would take this over. And since then, bioethics has become a standard by which many medical decisions are supposed to be adjudicated and decided partly on the basis of economics. We had a case here, the Rizzuli case, of a man who had a stroke, he was unconscious, and then graded persistently unconscious, and the doctors wanted to discontinue his uh, res respiration, his ventilation. And one of the reasons one of the doctors said in a newspaper article was, whatever the patient might want or the family might want, it's too expensive to society in Canada to maintain this guy <clears throat> who is going to be minimally conscious at best for an indeterminate period. Do doctors make the decisions now based on what the cost is to the system or what is needful for the patient? And why are neither the doctors nor the ethicists looking at what is needed to make a fulsome case for the care of us all? Bioethics, and certainly its major organization, the American Society for Bioethics and Humanities, is almost wholly silent on this. You can go through the literature of these journals and find eight, 10, 12 articles on conjoined twins, but not one, except maybe one by me, on these issues. Right. Bioethicists love talking about AI, but not about the necessities of the ER. Uh, Tom, I want to uh, just go back to the lifeboat, the, the real lifeboat uh, case, the William Brown, which is, you know, as you, as you mentioned, used as a, a paradigm for the current, uh, you know, way of thinking in, in the bioethical world. Uh, the, the, the lifeboat from the William Brown, uh, the history that you tell in your book, which is really riveting, and, and then you wrote an entire book on that particular case, 
right? So y you make very cogent points that the whole situation was the result of a lot of injustices to begin with. Yeah. You know, the fact that there was only one lifeboat when, you know, it could be anticipated that, that uh, boats would drown in those days. The, the fact that shipping companies companies would refuse to take a longer route, you know, they, they were trying to, yes. to compete. The fact that they were held unaccountable by governments, not only for their, their sort of reckless um, uh, behavior and, and strategies uh, of, of navigation, but also after the fact, when this uh, 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 case ca came up, the, the governments were primarily interested in safeguarding the interests of the shipping companies and the shipping yeah. industries you know, to, to the uh, you know to the, at the expense of uh, of justice, uh, essentially. So, so really, there was there's no reason to invoke uh, sort of a, uh, you know to throw our hands up and say, well, you know, that's the way life is. There's nothing we can do. There's plenty to be done. There was plenty to be done back then, and there's plenty to be done now. The book, The Wreck of the William Brown, that I wrote, based on my research, there was sold as a sea story. They didn't want a medical ethics book. They wanted a good riveting sea tale, but you're absolutely right. The passengers were Irish immigrants and nobody, they were called basically the Negroes of England. Nobody cared about them. They were strong backs and small minds. There was only one long boat. It wasn't really a lifeboat and a jolly boat for the captain, which would hold at most half of the passengers and all of the crew. All the crew got off, half the passengers drowned. There was no reason for that. After the Titanic in 1912, and this had happened again and again, by the way, before and after the William Brown, shipwrecks in the spring of the year in the iceberg corridor off of Newfoundland were about as common as auto accidents are today. Shipping news carried lists of them every year. It was a cost of doing business. And with insurance, it was just a cost the companies could accept. After the Titanic, several international committees were struck. And in 1919, an international maritime law was passed which said there had to be enough lifeboats, safety vessels for all passengers. And in the winter, the international route from Europe, from England primarily, to the United States was dropped six miles. So people would avoid the area of the icebergs. And since then, there has not been one death. Again, the necess necessity of scarcity was obliterated by a simple mechanism. Earlier, the shipping companies had said, we can't afford to, to provide lifeboats. Now we knew that society could not help but have them. And this is the way it is with many of the arguments about scarcity today. Yes, there are some things where we have short-term disallocation. The reasons why we need them and the ways to eliminate them are not the things that bioethics talks about, but the things that to me, a true ethicist must be concerned and a true citizen must be concerned with. Because remember, ethics is really about citizenship. Ethics is about not only you as a physician and me as whatever I am, but about all of us in the, the societies we want to create and the ways we wish to see justice. Can we cure the problem of the cost of health care? Of course we can. There's absolutely no doubt about that. I can tell you four ways to do it and to decrease those costs today. Do we need to sacrifice the children uh, with autism or Down syndrome? Do we need to sacrifice the elders? No, we don't. You have probably had, as I have, 92-year-old men and women going into hospital for a valve repair. It can now be done without open heart surgery, an amazing advance. Should we be saving them for the last two, three, five years of life? I think so. And if we say no, if we say those people aren't worth it, if we say we don't want to care for them, we have to give a better reason than we can't afford it for anybody who doesn't have gold-plated concierge health care. Right. So, Tom, you're, you're absolutely right, and I'm, I'm in total agreement. Now, the, this new ethics that has replaced, and, and we'll talk about, you know, you mentioned the Hippocratic, the traditional Hippocratic ethics. The, this new ethics, um, in, in, in the guidelines, because now our, we're bombarded as clinicians 
every uh, medical professional society has embraced this new ethics and so uh, cardiologists are getting guidelines about how we should um, you know not just think about our patients but think about the common and they will use terms like the common good and whatnot yes. but they give no uh, no specific uh, methods by which we can discern you know what kind of med medical decision how, how to uh, you know make make this uh, how to decide differently right they're very careful not to be too specific yes. but at the end of the day then it becomes a pure you know then at the end of the day you have it means that you 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 pass the decision on to the system the bureaucracies the ethics you know the, the rationing mechanisms uh, that is yes. remote from from the situation at hand that is going to impose some limits on that is going to actually impose scarcity where there might ha not have been uh, any scarcity to begin with interestingly this is a constant theme in all those nighttime tv drama shows where we have doctors doing new techniques, facing extraordinary problems. And since St. Elsewhere, the 1980s, the hospital folds because they can't afford it. And it's sort of the way society uses TV as a pressure valve for the fact that physicians are being put in an absolutely impossible position. And they have been actually for many years. My uncle who was one of the discoverers of PKU syndrome in the 60s. When he was a resident, they, they gave him all the blood work to do. They wouldn't, didn't want to let him out of the hospital because he was the only person who was going to vote for FDR in his whole damn hospital. And he would tell how he snuck out to vote. They so believed in FDR's vision of medicine. What's happened today is, yes, all these directors are coming. Autonomy, you're supposed to listen to the patient which is a good idea. Physicians have always negotiated with patients ever since Plato. If a patient says to you, I want to go to my daughter's wedding in two months. I want liposuction. Please take out 20% of my body fat. You don't say, sure, I'm glad to do that because that will kill the patient. And our job is first really is to do no harm and not be sued. The Medical societies and organizations since 96 have talked about professionalism as a contract with society in which one listens to the patient, one has to be very careful. Good physicians have always listened to their patient. The problems have come with the research people for whom the patient is a cipher. And so what happens is there is very little mechanism in your professional organizations or in bioethics at large or in the professionalism community, which is a whole study of itself, which says what we want to do is to talk about the necessity of change in the system at large so that we can do the best for the people we care for. Only pub, even public health physicians deal patient by patient in the community. Epidemiologists, and I work sometimes as an epidemiologist, will often deal at distance with large groups where where is it going to, Ebola going to be next? Where are the risk factors for the next influenza? The great thing about that is you don't have to see somebody in distress. I love dealing with diseases at remove. But the fact is, if you deal with people who are in your charge, they're in your care, they're your responsibility, and because of bioethics and economics, that has been taken progressively away from the ability to manage. The AMA says some nice things, other organizations do, bioethics is silent here, and that is my big beef with them. I like Kant, I'll read Immanuel Kant, I'll read Plato. I'm not sure what they have to do with the decision of a, of a physician in the ER who sees somebody coming in with no health care, who says, this is a surgery or protocol you need but we can't afford to give it to you. And that is the question we should be asking as citizens who may or may not have the right health care, because we have known for over a hundred years that the health of any of us sooner or later affects the health of all. That's the great lesson that comes from epidemiology. So Dr. Koch, you're, you're, uh, you're Do present. Do I sound a little passionate here? Yeah, that's good. We like passion here. <laughs> we like it. it down and sound a little <laughs> No, no, no. It's great. You, you're, so the premise is that um, bioethicists and 
physicians to a larger part for many years now have been serving the interests of the state uh, more so than the interests of the individual. Um, now, of course, um, bioethicists, I take it, and uh, physicians who promote uh, shared decision making and patient autonomy would uh, strongly disagree, correct? They would see themselves as actually defenders of individual choice and freedom uh, rather than protectors of economic uh, profits. I mean, yes. so. I mean, we'll have to get what? another glass of water because this is an important point. You're absolutely right. Remember that I'm a Canadian, and so I live in a system of national health care applied by the provinces. I no longer live in the United States with the health care system that guides you. But you're absolutely right. In general, bioethicists see themselves as the guardians and promoters of patient choice and autonomy, while at the same time, in many instances, saying we have to take that away because it's too expensive. We have to allow them... Some people want to force us all to be part of trials, uh, drug trials, so that we can advance science whether we want to or not. So at the one time they are promoters of autonomy and at the same time takers of it in situations where it will benefit, say, big pharma. And other situations where, yes, you want this, but the system will not pay, our insurer won't pay that for you. At the same time, uh, traditional medicine which put a lot of load of responsibility on the physician, never, never forgot that it was a duet between the patient, the patient's family, and the physician. As far back as Plato, we have Plato and Gorgias talking about the person who hires a philosopher to convince the patient to a procedure he doesn't want, because the doctor knows that it's needed, and he wants the patient to understand why he thinks it is. Patients have always been able to refuse. There have been doctors who have been heavy-handed, closed-minded, and unpleasant. There have been patients like that, too. There are bioethicists like that, too. But in the main, most physicians know when you're at the bedside with a frightened person that you sometimes have to take a little time to talk and explain. The great problems that occurred and these have occurred several times since the 1960s, uh, have been problems really with research medicine, like Tuskegee, like Willowbrook, like uh, Mount Sinai in New York, where doctors were more committed to the research agenda that they were pursuing than to the needs of the individual in front of them. And so when Hodge. we do research, we can't forget that whatever drug trial we might believe could benefit. The issue there is not the drug itself, but the needs of the patient first. And good doctors understand that. But if, Dr. Hodge, if, if, we, if, if this has been the case since, you know, um, uh, since the six, well, for, for a long time, as you've uh, kind of drawn out in your book that uh, physicians and bioethicists, um, prominent ones uh, who steer the field have uh, uh, been more on the side of the state and corporations. Why, why is it that uh, in the United States, say, um, you know, we've gone from 5% of our GDP going towards healthcare then to now, you know, almost 20% of our GDP going yeah. towards healthcare. Have they not failed oh, miserably? No, that's, that's, so perhaps, perhaps. Oh, that's, an, that's an easy question. Thank you very much for the softball. The answer is the United States is least efficient most expensive system in the developed world. It but are we not uh, emergency are, rooms alone? I think. Are, are we not spending? Are we not spending? I mean, if there were I'm sorry, I lost you for a sec. That's okay. If, the, if you know, if the bioethicists and the physicians we're talking about uh, are as effective uh, as you're saying in terms of reducing uh, uh, what the state is paying for folks. Um, should we not be seeing, uh, you know, spending at the end of life and the last month of life be very minimal, but in instead we have, you know, uh, intensive care units and emergency departments filled with uh, uh, patients that, uh, uh, um, are, you know, that, that, we're, that we spend a tremendous amount of money on. We, we have uh, a very avid heart transplant systems. We have very uh, 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 productive and... Uh, um, busy dialysis programs. Uh, so um, 
are, are, are we not actually, I mean, if, if it's, if this is the case, isn't, isn't the outcome that's, that's kind of, we've seen over the last 30, 40 years, kind of the opposite of what uh, you would be suggesting ha have happened? No, there are questions about the levels of care which should be provided to very fragile seniors. Do they need this or that test necessarily? A lot of those people who are at the end of their lives would be better served by home and palliative care. And I work with a service here that does home palliative than they would be being put in hospital. There are many people who are in hospital because there are not retirement community beds they can go to or an insurer who won't pay for them. So there is that too. A lot of the cost of the American system can, is, comes in the multiple bureaucracies overlaid by the insurers, the HMOs, the drug companies, and a concern about the litigiousness in some of these situations. The drugs that I take daily cost me, something like a tour of a stat, and I pay $4.11 per month. Uh, I was in the United States and ran out, and I wanted to get a 10, and that cost me $120. So a lot of the costs are built into your system because of the way the hospital and the pharma care are organized, you could immediately cut costs in the United States through a national plan, through a national drug plan, and through reining in of big pharma. Uh, remember that 50% of all of the money that goes into drug research is not from the drug company. It's from the government and the public. And yet we get very little benefit in terms of cost coming out at the other end if that drug goes to market. So yes, you're absolutely right. There are situations in which the care may be excessive and unnecessary. As a gerontologist, I time and again see seniors who the first thing that their nutrition does is go over the med list and cut back kind of the drugs, which have been either mal-prescribed or no longer necessary. On the other hand, that is not the heart of the problem of the cost of care in the United States. The cost is a system that is really unbelievable to all of the other countries in the OECD. Michelle, may I have a couple? No, Michelle, I have a couple words. <laughs> no, that, that, that's fine. Actually, I, I'm in general agreement. Uh, you know, we may disagree <clears throat> on the details of, of the specific uh, economic factors at play, but I, I'm in, in uh, general agreement with, uh, with Tom. Where I, I may want to not so much push back, but maybe uh, put a little more blame, uh, put, put some blame a little more evenly um, um, on, on the doctors as much as on the bioethicists. Um, you know, Tom, so if, if bioethics emerged in the 1960s and 70s, um, I think it's, uh, you know, and emerged in saying that the, uh, the traditional Hippocratic oath uh, or Hippocratic ethics were, you know, uh, insufficient for modern medicine and, and the, uh, you know, the, our current system. Uh, I think to, to, what ex to some extent, um, the, um, they were uh, correct that doctors themselves had, in, to my mind, um, or many doctors, certainly the, the, the leadership of, of the medical communities had given up on the traditional Hippocratic ethics. And they, yeah. they gave up uh, on it uh, in the 1910s. You know, for me, licensing is a very, very uh, treacherous thing. Uh, doctors, um, at least in, in the United States, and I think to some extent in Canada, uh, convinced governments to grant doctors um, monopoly privileges to practice medicine um, on on the uh, you know using the argument that now it's different because now medicine is quote unquote scientific and therefore doctors are are sort of semi scientists you know and and they the work of the doctor is to to apply science to the patient. Uh, which is something that was fought uh, uh, quite uh, vehemently by um, uh, William Osler, who you, you mentioned in your book, right? So Osler was against this idea of, of uh, the physician, physician scientist as being, you know, the, the new kind of doctor. He, 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 he rightfully, in my mind, viewed the, the, the duty to the patient as being primordial. And so the medical profession, you know, in my, my opinion, you know, traded away its uh, ethics. And there was a vacuum, and we see that we see that in the 1920s and 30s and 40s, with a lot of 
scandalous behavior among doctors, not all of them, but some of them, eugenics mm -hmm. and, you know, a lot of unnecessary sur yeah. surgeries being performed left and right because now they have a monopoly power. They are viewed as uh, having a privileged position in society to do this. So it's not so, um, it's, it's, it's understandable that the bioethicist would come and say, hey, wait a minute, you know, there's a problem here and we need to inject ourselves yeah. uh, into the mix. Sure. Let me stress that my hope with Thieves of Virtue and with the other things I've written in journals and elsewhere on this stuff is that nobody, including me, has all the answers. But I insist that the discussion be begun and the bioethics be held to the standard of the principles and the ideas with which it advanced itself from the start. The issue of the relation between doctors as carers and doctors as researchers, the issue of science, which you correctly say came up, especially in the early 20th century, is something that has never really, it's a balance which often has been fraught with difficulty. Banting and Best with insulin are the best examples. Guys who tinkered around, they found this thing called insulin. They said, hey, this is important. We're going to give it to the world. The same thing with the salt vaccine, which wasn't held off for a fast path. Uh, the very famous story now of Hala, the Hala immortal cancer cells. The guy who found these cells from Henrietta Lakes didn't charge anybody for them. He sent them to other researchers and important tools. He never made a dime. So there was a period in which some of this medicine science all worked for social good, the good of medicine at large. But of course, there have always been physicians and quacks who have made this all a matter of their own income and availability. How much should doctors be regulating themselves? I think that's an open question. I think the idea of citizen participation, and here's where bioethics had a great idea, in these discussions and pastoral. I have no problem with having a pastor or a rabbi coming in to talk about the hard cases. They're the ones who often spend the most time with patients and nurses. <clears throat> so what I want to do, what I believe, is that ethics requires a community involvement in which the understanding of the physician or the nurse at bedside, of the administrator at large, and of the citizens in the communities where this occurs, ideally we would all have a voice. And we could all have this published in the newspaper without your president commenting by a tweet. So the bioethicists weren't all wrong, but the problem is they were, they were at best maybe half right. And that has made it very difficult for two, three generations of medical students who are now told they have to be able to do research. They have to have a, to get their placements up here. They should have a paper or two done. They have to see themselves in this way first. And as you know, Many doctors who are good, caring, technical people, they can do their jobs as general medicine or specialty. They're not going to be great researchers. It's a peculiar person who takes on the problem of technical research. I'm all for that. They might not be good with patients. Why should Nobody has to be everything, which is why I'm doing what I do instead of being a, a full-time physician because I torch chemistry. No, I think the I think the the, the parts the, the parts of your uh, book and your thesis that really speak to me are uh, the parts that uh, that ask what place do uh, uh, dead German philosophers have uh, at the bedside? I think you you channeled your uh, your that wonderful uh, student of yours who was uh, dreadlocked and wearing a Marley T-shirt, I guess, who was asking some very insightful questions of you. So uh, that 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 that's incredibly meaningful to me because I find a lot of times we are placed in these weird positions where we are seen or we're being made into these technocrats, um, right? We're, we are the ones with the technical expertise and we understand how to fiddle this with the vent and do that with the uh, uh, blood pressure medicine, uh, but. Larger questions that come to, well, what should I do? What's the overall path we should take with this particular 82-year-old patient who has heart failure, who's on a ventilator, and how's, how best should we proceed, um, uh, whether an aggressive course or not? That's kind of been taken out of the – that decision is being taken away from the clinician who's been taking care of the patient. And yeah. suddenly, we at this – 
a, a crucial point, we somehow want to call someone else in who doesn't know the patient, doesn't even have the expertise in, say, heart failure or, yeah. I don't know, the defibrillator that the patient has or the ventilator the patient has or even how severe the pneumonia is. And you have this other person come in. Um, we, you know, here at palliative care uh, or, you know, uh, consult or whatnot. Yeah. And uh, they come in and they're supposed to somehow have this scale that they weigh and then kind of tell us or not tell us, uh, they, they won't say tell us, yeah. but guide us somehow. And, 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 I, and I think you would be in agreement that that decision shouldn't be taken away from the clinician at the bedside, correct? I mean, we're the ones best uh, in the best position to be able to s sort this out if, if, if we truly are beholden to the patient and not, you know, subsumed yeah. to the state. Yeah, I mean, you're, it's not only the patient. You have talked to the patient preoperatively. You've right. assessed that condition. Normally, one or more members of that person's family will be there with their hopes and fears. Right, right. When you crack open a chest and you see that heart, diseased but beating, or when you're snaking up a mitral valve going through the system, trying to repair that mitral valve, you are in a position of absolute, awesome, terrifying authority. When the quest, when you have the hard questions, you're also the person who has talked to the patient and the family. And I think that is something denigrated by many of the people who make decisions without being at the bedside. Joe Finns talks about this in terms of patients with persistent unconsciousness and the people who come along say, really want to get these patients done so we can harvest the organs. I think physicians need better schooling in the balance in these areas, but there will always be, as Osler said and Penfield knew, well, uh, Penfield was another great Canadian physician, there are the cases that keep you awake at night. There are the cases for which there is no good answer and you take all the in input you can. When somebody asks me, did I make the right decision? I say, did you stay up at night? They say, yeah, I couldn't get any sleep. Did you maybe have an extra drink or two? Yeah. Did you want to go back and start smoking? I did. And this was a decision you came to? Yeah. Then that's the right one because the closest we get are the hardest decisions. Oliver Sacks also said this, that the hard decisions you lie awake at night where there is no clear answer. And you that's when an ethicist may, or a pastor may provide good input to you, may provide balance. So That's terrific, uh, uh, Tom. I just want to say something. This is really terrific. It's, it's a point really, I'm so glad you, you made it because now uh, doctors, the quality of the decision is not is based on more and more on outcomes, quote unquote. So, so the physician has to, uh, you know, is, is being judged on how many people survive, you know, the, these sort of hard outcomes that can be objectively uh, ascertained by the bureaucrats. And it's terrible because you can the right decision you're absolutely right cannot depend on the outcome right i mean these are very difficult decisions and and one you know you can go one way or the other and be correct in either case the bureaucrats aren't making the decision on what's best for the patient they're looking at the general stats right we ran right. i ran into this when i was at sick kids hospital for sick children in toronto in the 90s when the question was about heart transplants for very, very serious young people, and what was a good outcome? If somebody had one good year, was that sufficient to give them a heart? If the prognosis was, we can transplant this child, but this child will not see three years, is one good year enough? We don't know what will happen five years out with that other patient, and at that point, the longevity of heart transplant patients was about 10 to 12 years, is there so immunosuppressed? That's a question we have to ask, not only in medicine, but also engage with the people we care for, society at large, and we forget, and I didn't say this strongly enough in the book, that first and foremost, we are citizens, and we are parents, and we are members of a community where we serve. We are then professionals trained in certain things where we are serving and inputting the community. But we would all in these hard situations like to have 
a better guideline, which understood that in the care of the person, we have to weigh this in ways which to the average citizen is not understood. And medicine has to make that clearer, and we have to make clearer to the bureaucrats, I don't care about the long numbers, let's look at the short numbers. Do we need to do, I had a, with a radiologist who said, do I really need to do an x-ray on this woman who's 96 and has a broken toe? I know it's broken. I said, no, you don't. That's silly. He said, what about this 92-year-old woman who was sent in for, for a spine, the x-ray of the spine to see if she's got stenosis? Of course she's got stenosis. She's got arthritis. She's 92. I said, yes, but if you can identify where it is and that pain can be relieved, you can give her two, three, five, ten years pain-free. That one can make sense. The woman with the broken big toe did not. And I think in a lot of these situations, we can apply a simpler ruler like that to what is appropriate and what we want as a people for ourselves and our loved ones. Because in the end, sooner a friend of mine who recently retired, I said, why did you retire? You're only 73. You've been practicing medicine 45 years. He said, when I found I was spending more time as a patient than as a physician, I decided it was time to hang it up. <laughs> Sooner or later, we are all patients. Right, but Dr. Coach, it is, so this is where, so you know, you, you agree that uh, you're in general agreement that, that clinicians should be making these, should be making these decisions based on what, you know, as members of the community, as, as uh, beholden to the patient that's in front of them, you know, going along with the Hippocratic Oath. But, but here's where we'll, we'll part way slightly and, you know, you let me know why I'm not thinking clearly about this. If you have, if you, if you, how then, if you take physicians and have them employed by the system, right? If you're employed by the system, you're beholden to the system, right? So isn't isn't the the best way of codify maybe the wrong word, but insert another word. But isn't the best way to codify this uh, um, putting the patient first uh, be one where the patient is the master of you in an economic sense? So so when you have when you have a pa when you have a person in front of you, right, uh, who's an 85 year old person with heart failure, and you're trying to manage their heart failure, um, uh, if they if they are paying if they if they are are, are paying you, and I'm not, uh, yeah, you you have a much much you you perhaps have a much clearer set of priorities, or at least your head is not as muddled when you're making yeah. decisions as it is when the system employs you. And if the system, which is what we're moving to these days in terms of vertically integrated systems, is the insurance company, you know, is the payer, plus is the hospital and, and, and they're incentivized, say, to you know, save yes. money, uh, reduce, reduce uh, admissions through the ER and whatnot. There are all these perverse in incentives that happen when you're employed by the system. Um, it seems to me that you know, the, the best way to kind of actuate what you're talking about is to go the complete opposite way from a type of state-based uh, healthcare system. That's interesting. I think what I'm saying, first of all, is I don't want an auto physicians to rule no matter what anybody says, no matter what. I think physicians at the bedside and nurses at the bedside should be primary voices in these areas. Right. I, of course, I think we should listen to patients. If a patient says, I don't want any more care, I can't take this chemo, I listen. On the other hand, many of the decisions today are extremely complex. And if the patient comes in and says, I saw this medication on TV, they said they're going to make my fibromyalgia, my, my diabetes go away. I'm not, you shouldn't just prescribe it because they saw a TV advertisement. Because you do know right. more. For the patient, this is a once in a lifetime. For you, you see 50 right. patients a day. The real issue you're presenting to me, and this is an interesting one to ask a Canadian, is the degree to which by being members of employees rather than independent professionals, yep. you in fact see the very, very ethical autonomy that was once part of the Hippocratic Oath. And the answer is that's one of the reasons why we have to change the systems. Yes, that is part of the problem. In the national healthcare system in Canada and in Ontario, one has pushback from doctors arguing these things, and because it's a public system, 
it becomes an issue which is brought up on the TV news, it's an issue brought up in the newspapers, people write letters, it's brought into the legislature. So we have a certain feedback loop in some of these areas which you do not have in the United States when you're working for a vertically integrated uh, a system in, in San Francisco or in Boston. We have trained young physicians to be expert in many things, but not to look at the context of the care system itself. And this was where bioethics to me was a failing, where we should be training ethicists and physicians to be activists to find the medium we need for these situations, which I admitted at the beginning and insist again, can balance very complex goals, very com in the midst of very complex obstacles, in the midst of real fears. You and I have both known physicians who were young and ambitious and really wanted to do this operation, which they knew was pretty damn chancy, but wow, it's just so good. I was once young too, a long time ago. And the older physicians used to say, yeah, maybe, but not yet. The matter of physician judgment and responsibility for it is another subject for another conversation. Today we're talking about, let me just return to the way in which bioethics may make a decision, may make a grand statement about autonomy without understanding the complexity of what that means at the bedside and in an increasingly economically driven bureaucratic system far removed from the needs of the patient and I would say of society at all. Right. And that's what I and Bernie Sanders, I suspect, I've been cultivating my Bernie Sanders haircut as I go bald. <laughs> that is what I suspect we need to do to change the system at large. Um, of course, people can also read my books about this and they can invite me down for high price, high paid lectures at lovely restaurants, but that's not going to happen. But we uh, we'll listen to you, though. So <laughs> you need to get forward and say, here is what we need to make it the best for us all. Remembering that these are life and death decisions sometimes for which the good answer is not always clear. And we need a little humility as ethicists, as bureaucrats, and as physicians in dealing with the places where it is at best opaque and the health and security of the people are lying in the balance. That's all I'm saying. I'm yeah. really quite no, modest in all this. No, that's that's a wonderful uh, a wonderful statement and I can't couldn't uh, can't can't possibly ag agree more with uh, certainly having more humility on all sides uh, for sure. Um, we'll, we'll have so, to I think Michelle will agree we'll have to out there talk to your vertical bosses on San, <laughs> San Francisco. Well, well, we'll have to. when it warms up you you need to bring me out at a high I mean I may be I may be a young senior but I still have to make a living. <laughs> <laughs> but Michelle, we'll have we'll have to bring uh, Dr. Koch back to uh, to spend a whole episode on uh, on on pharma, don't you think? Uh, yes. We do, and we, we could we could spend you know. It, um, so for full disclosure, Tom, we we uh, we didn't bring you in here to 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 trap you on certain political and economic uh, issues. Uh, Anish and I are are very strong defenders of what we would consider a true uh, a true free market. And what you criticize in the book, uh, I criticize as well which is uh, this kind of crony corporatist uh, involvement between the state and large corporations, which we want to have nothing to do with. And, and we believe, we, perhaps uh, wrongly, but, but uh, I certainly do, that uh, if there was truly, you know, medicine should be a voluntary relationship between people. And it doesn't have to be just the doctor. And yeah. there can be voluntary institutions that spring up naturally that can mediate the, some of these difficulties between the different interests of the parties involved. And I think if, if we look at it that way, I think you and I have a lot in, in common. You know, we'd, we'd agree on a lot of things. Um, no, but, yeah, but I think that's the point. I think that everyone would, will agree on the sentiments of Dr. Koch. And, and I mean, who who is, I mean, 90, I mean, the, the large majority of physicians, the large majority of uh, community members, patients uh, agree with these basic general uh, principles. The, the question is uh, just uh, the winding path one uh, one takes to that. Is it a path which leads us towards more, more centralization, more bureaucracy, or is it a path that uh, is there? Is there another path? So that's that's the that's no, the there, are, that's the there are other paths. There are yeah. there are other paths, and they can be easily discernible if we have the will to go there. Right. right. Um, medicine is complex. Pharmacology is. A, I mean, even in my lifetime, I remember when there were three to four antibiotics 
which doctors gave out with impunity. That was, you know, whatever you had, you were going to get erythromycin. That was fine. I remember you had a broken anything, soaking in aluminum sebacitate. I worked at a clinic in Guatemala when I was young where there was no surgery. And there was like six drugs that we could use for all of the population that we dealt with. Um, the type of economic system we have now, especially in the U.S., is not just is a peculiar form of capitalism, which grew up after World War II and which became rampant under Reaganomics in the 1980s. And I don't think it has served the society at large myself. I think it has certainly been detrimental to the health and welfare of people at large. We can talk about the economics at another point. There are people better to speak about that than I. I think there are ways in each system, mine, yours, England's, France's, where we can find economies if we need to. I think we, we could all save a lot of money by with some very simple rules about big pharma and about the cost of drugs, which should not be $500,000 to save one life, especially when the trials have gone through uh, the population. I think there are lots of ways to do that. I think there are lots of ways to decrease cost. Here at, after my last uh, total hip replacement, I went home after three days, but I had follow-up nursing and physio for two weeks at the house to make sure I was safe that the wound was clean and not infected, to make sure that I would be able to get up and down without a problem. So I didn't have to go back in from a fall and refit. I have seniors who have fallen because they didn't have the money to have a lifeline at home. They didn't have money to basically adjust themselves. They go in, they fracture their, they have their femur, they're in rehab for six months. That was avoidable. And I think we can look at what's avoidable and what's practical, what's humane and what is the best medicine that you guys know how to provide. Do I have all the answers? No. <laughs> Do I have the wishes? Yes. Do I think we need that conversation? Absolutely. Do I think those bioethicists, and I am one. Do I think the bioethicists provide it? I say very rarely. <laughs> you know, Tom, before, before we close, because we're, we're nearing the end, but um, I want to go back a little bit to, uh, to more concrete bioethical problems. And, uh, and in particular, one chapter in your book that I think is dear to your heart and dear to mine as well. Um, I want to start by, by uh, mentioning the, um, uh, the Beauchamp and Childress book, which is, you know, the Bible of bioethics. And you make a very um, good case, or, or you show at least in your book how even though it is called principles of bioethics, if you go from one edition to the next, you see those principles morph and morph and morph, you know, right. over the years. And, and then, so the principles of bioethics then seem to lead to what now you, you call the bioethics uh, of the conformal human and yeah. things that are really outrageous for anyone with, with any, any, any sense, any moral sense at all. Um, and people who are invited and given all the awards, the Peter Singers of the world, people who, bioethicists, who are telling us in, on, under what condition it is okay to kill our own children even after they're born, right? And, and that sort of thing. So all kinds of craziness, you know, how to abort Down syndrome babies and, and, and to justify all kinds of horrible things. Do you want to speak to that a little bit? Sure. First, let me just say that I've served with the Canadian Down Syndrome Society uh, and I was twice on the board for 18 years. I like people with Down syndrome. I like them a lot more than I like those folks from Mensa. I have the greatest admiration for some of these people you've just mentioned. Peter Singer, the philosopher at Princeton, I think is honest and honorable. I just think he's wrong. Uh, I think he's been upfront in what he believes. I think if you read Singer and don't like what he says, he's the logical endpoint of all these things I'm talking about. The book Principle of Bioethics, which is now in, I don't know, I think it's 13th edition, was the first critical summation of an idea of bioethics based on a series of principles in a sort of somewhat a Kantian frame, Immanuel Kant. It was a groundbreaking and an epic and a beautiful piece of intellectual work. But like Kant, great writer when you can understand him, I don't carry Kant to the bedside. I think the principles become muddy, and that's why they kept trying to fine-tune it when you get to the complexities of reality. 
And so that's why I argue a bit of humility to those who have read principles and think they know what the ethics is of a specific situation in front of them. I find that when I say to people, I don't know, but I'll try and find out, they will tend to believe much more what I have to say later. I find when I'm lecturing and I say, that's something I hadn't thought about, let me come back to you because I'm not sure. People tend to believe everything else I've said. When we, in all of our roles, either as bureaucrats, as physicians, as nurses, as ethicists, have the humility to say, this is a toughie and it's not clear, let's work on it. We have a much better situation of improving the system at large and pro providing the best care for the person that we can go home and not feel bad about. And I worry about the many people I know in medicine who go home progressively today and feel bad about what they do because the system seems to thwart the impulses which took them to it. And that is something in my humility, I am deadly opposed to. I want people to go home thinking, I did a good job with that person today. Tom, your book is called Thieves of Virtue, When Bioethics Stole Medicine. It is available on Amazon. It is also available, I think, uh, through your website or perhaps linked to through your website. Can you tell us what your website is, the, the URL? Sure. And as I said, I don't think I have all the answers. My website, you can send me an email. It's pretty sim simple. It's http colon two forward slashes is all our k-o-c-h w-o-r-k-s kochworks.com kochworks.com we'll have this on the show note do you are you on Thank social you. media you have a facebook page or a twitter handle i have a like facebook that. page and that's that's as far as i'll go all right well <laughs> if you want us to link it on the show notes we can you can send me an email and i'll link it on the show notes we will certainly Thank link you. your, your books uh and, and it's been a wonderful conversation. Really, really, I'm excited about your book. I want as many people uh, to read it as possible. I think you, you touch on something very important that is not talked about at all. And uh, I think, you know, uh, Anish uh, suggested we should have you again, and I'm sure uh, we'll have another opportunity another time if, you'd, if you care I, to join us. I again. very much appreciate your questions. I very much appreciate Anish trying to catch, trying to find the limits of what I'm saying, not to catch, but to pay. And I hope that from this and from any future work, maybe we can find a more reasonable and a better answer for ourselves and our communities in the work that we do. So thank you very much both for this. Thank Thanks you so much. Yep.